Hi, good afternoon. I did remember my notes is the water I forgot. We are in part 12 on our study of Hebrews. Seems like it's taken a real long time, but it has. Uh, we had a, a three, four, a six months, I mean, six months before I preached last Sunday on Hebrews chapter 11. So we are, since we're on chapter, part 12, we're in chapter 12. So take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Obviously, my intent is not to deal with the entire chapter. Uh, it's the way I've dealt with the book is just going through each chapter and finding a truth out of it, hopefully being cohesive, making sense in regards to the difference between the old covenant, Christ being the fulfillment of the new covenant. And I will, our, our reading or what our consideration is going to be verses one through three uh, this afternoon. And to gave it, gain us a little bit of context, uh, I'm going to read verses 39 and 40. Remember the, the um, Hebrews chapter 11 is that hall of faith. So we have many examples of faith in the old covenant. And verse 39, all these, all those that were in the old covenant, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us, And then our verses, these three verses, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. When a preacher prepares a sermon, two questions may be in his mind. What do I hope to accomplish in this message? And second question is, can I accomplish that with this message? Can I take care of that intention that I have? This is where the preacher, when he's done with his sermon, he either tears up his manuscript and starts over, or he says, God's will be done, and his hope is that the Lord will use a crooked stick to draw a straight line. Spurgeon brought this out. A minister that aims at nothing hits nothing and accomplishes nothing. But here, not so with our preacher. This part of our preacher's sermon has the best intention, and Pastor Renahan mentioned that in his uh, morning message, and that is to encourage his hearers, to encourage these believers. Encouragement to God's people can never be underestimated. For these dear Christians here, consider the grave temptation that they had. They had a stumbling block set before them, and that was this. Go back to the old covenant. It's been around a lot longer than Christianity. That was the stumbling block that was laid at their feet. Our writer has dismantled that building since it's built on sand by demonstrating the excellency of Jesus Christ. His superiority compared to angels, prophets, Moses. Now, not that these angels or prophets competing against Christ. They were all pointing to Christ problem was is that the Jewish believers, or I should say the Jewish leaders, were just simply looking at the old covenant and not moving on to the promise of the new covenant. Even the old covenant's priesthood was to be ignored. The sacrifices that were inferior. When these Jewish believers come to chapter 11, their faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ being the Messiah, and the faith of these Old Testament believers has the same substance. Looking forward to the Messiah, they're looking back to the Messiah. Overwhelming evidence here that these Jewish Christians are joined with these believers here in Hebrews chapter 11 of the Old Covenant Hebrews. There was no difference. Their object of their faith was the same the New Testament believers knew the identity of the Messiah. Therefore, this cloud of witnesses in 11 testifies that God can be trusted, God can be believed, 
and that the just should live by faith. Even though these Old Testament saints were severely persecuted. Look at verse 36 of chapter 11. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And these Christians here that were reading this letter, that this letter was being preached to them, they also experienced similar trials. When you look at chapter 10 and verse 32... But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, plural. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. You had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. They lost their goods by being Christians, knowing that you had a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So these Old Testament saints, these New Testament believers had experienced the same faith and the same persecutions. And even though these Old Testament saints were dead, they still speak by the word of God. So with all of this in mind, we look at verse 1. And if you're taking notes, the first point is this. It's a command. A command. These witnesses surrounded the writer and this church. Not that these dead saints could actually see them. I was reading a commentary which said that these dead saints could actually see the New Testament saints. I strongly disagree with that. But here's the thing that encompasses them. It's the Old Testament testimony. The Old Testament believers' testimony encompassed these believers. And in view of these Old Testament brethren, action is demanded. Notice he says, let us, let us lay aside every weight. So including writer, including these Hebrew believers, they are to throw off distractions, weights, and sins that hinder in this race of faith. Now, our rider may very well have had a racing competition in an arena in mind. When you look at certain phrases, such as cloud of witnesses, that indicates spectators. Or a race, athletes running. Now, I want you to imagine these runners lining up for this important track event with their proper footwear and their light clothing because they're looking for the best results. They're running to win. Now, I want you to imagine, so you got nine people in a race. Eight of them are all dressed appropriately. And we have this one guy come out now, this one athlete who has a $2,000 Armani suit and $700 Gucci shoes. Now, the one clothed in such a way probably senses that his competitors are looking at him, laughing at him with scorn. And he would say something like, well, don't you like my suit? It's a $2,000 Armani suit. Guy said, yeah, it looks great. What about my Gucci shoes? $700 Gucci shoes. Don't I look really good with these shoes on? And they would probably say, yeah, you look just great. But you know what? We're going to leave you in the dust. And everyone is going to be laughing at you. You will be a laughing stock because you're not dressed properly. This isn't a time to buy wearing dress-up shoes as well as a suit. Before the Christian can run the race, before he gets up every day to walk, he needs to leave behind hindrances. He needs to leave behind weights, even things that are legitimate. Sometimes the Christian knows that he has to leave those things behind. And our writer even says, the sin which so easily ensnares us. Remember that, dear brethren. 
sin easily ensnares us. We are not, uh, we're not distant from it. It sticks with us. It's remaining sin, unnecessary burdens, even things that are lawful. If they hinder the walk of the Christian, they should be left behind. The Christian must get ready to continue on in this race of faith with wisdom. And I would submit to you a lot less of the world and a lot more of God's truth. Now, in other words, these Hebrews are taught by Old Testament saints. Thinking back, how they ran their life, how they ran their race, and experienced by these older saints aids those who are running. Much like that runner that's guided by that seasoned coach, it's not his first rodeo, it's not his first race. He's run many races, and he coaches his runner how to run. Experience is huge. In the business world, you don't make someone the manager of something if he knows nothing at all of the business that he's in. Or you wouldn't expect some athlete who's really never run in a race, you put him in varsity. It takes experience. Just like a Christian, a pastor cannot be a novice. He's got to be knocked around this world a little bit as a Christian and be able to endure to prove himself to be a Christian. And same with these dear believers. They were to look to these dead saints and how they speak, how they teach, how they coach these brethren by the word of God. Old Testament saints endured, and as a result, they can be a guide, even those that did not receive the promise. They did not receive the promise. So the course is set before the Christian. The Christian may not know the length of the race, but God does. God does, and that shows faith in our God. Let me talk a little bit about running. In case you've never run before, let me let you in on a little secret. Running is vigorous. Running is painful. Running is difficult. I hate running. And I don't say that with a smile on my face. I ran cross country. I was a lousy runner in high school, but I hated running. I ran in college, not competitively, believe me, I could not. They timed me with a calendar when I ran. I hated running during my 20s and my 30s. I, I competed in three sprint triathlons. I love the swimming. I love the biking. I hate the running. And my wife and I, we go on the trail, and we love to bike, and we have a smile on our face. And what I don't understand is when I ride by a person that's running, why are they smiling? That's painful. I've run long enough to know I'm pounding my joints, I'm pounding my back, nothing good is happening except for I guess I'm getting in shape and I can eat a little bit more food. There must be truly something else that I can do. And so I took up biking and swimming. The point of our rider here, and forgive my levity on running, is that the Christian walk is vigorous, painful and difficult. Go out and run during this week and say this is how the Christian life is. Do not minimize the narrow gate required. You must strive to enter through the narrow gate. Christianity is not a spectator sport or a mere talk of religious ideas. Christianity is active with much exertion because we must deny ourselves we must deny ungodliness, we must deny worldly lusts, and live soberly, righteously, not to get saved, but because we are in Christ. We are in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are right with God, so we walk in a world that is completely contrary to our God and our Savior. This world is not a friend of grace. Now, Pastor Renahan, I'll probably say this a couple more times. Pastor Renahan mentioned Ephesians 6. And Ephesians 6 uses military terms for the right reason. It is indeed the Christian life is a spiritual battle. Dangers are in this life. They are within us. They are outside of us. The Lord Jesus gave the command, strive to enter through the narrow gate. 
And one translation says, take up your cross, which is an instrument of death, which is an instrument of self-denial, take it up daily. Cut off limbs, pluck out eyes, and put to death the deeds of the flesh. Violent terms for the Christian, not inactivity. Thankfully, the race is regulated by God. It's progressive as the Christian continues to move forward in his walk. Luke 21, 34, the Lord Jesus says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day, talking about the day when the Lord Jesus comes back, Come on you unexpectedly. Colossians 3 8. This is to Christians. But now you yourselves are to put off these anger, which begins in the heart, malice begins in the heart, wrath, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And then Galatians 5, verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. We have remaining sin that goes against that which is holy, the Holy Spirit. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. You're not under the condemnation or the power of sin. Now, the works of the flesh, they're evident. They're obvious. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, deals with sexual immorality there. Idolatry, sorcery, the first four, command, uh, first four commands in the Decalogue. Hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Not only these things, but things that are related to it, Paul says. Just as I told you in times past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul moves them on to activity. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There is putting to death the deeds of the flesh according to the word of God. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute. I thought you were supposed to be encouraging us here in this sermon. I thought that's what the writer was supposed to be doing here, encouraging us. I got a lot against me. I have remaining sin. I've got the world. I've got the devil fighting against me. There's a lot against me. Well, our writer doesn't even give the command to lay aside that weight and that sin. He even says in verse 14 and 15, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring it up cause trouble. And by this, become defiled. And he mentions the fornicator, the profane person, this is overwhelming. How can I do this? How can I live the Christian life? Which leads us to verse 2. This is the remedy. This is the remedy. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How do we run this race? How does the Christian walk by faith in this race when he has so much against him? Well, there's been a name not named at all in all of chapter 11 and in verse 1 of chapter 12. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They are to look to that one. Now, that does not minimize Old Testament saints as they are an encouragement to these believers because they performed a very difficult task. And you can learn much from someone who's been tried and true. But, you know, to try and to complete the Christian walk in your own energy and in your own strength is going to be a losing effort. You're going to be in an Armani suit with Gucci shoes is what you're going to be in, trying to run around and you look like a fool. Discouragement will indeed prevail if you look within the energy of yourself. 
failure after failure, those not looking in the right direction, instead of looking forward at the right one, they will eventually lose heart, and it will be a hopeless pursuit. The righteous man may fall, but he gets back up because he's looking at the right one. He's looking at one who's far greater than these Hebrew 11, chapter 11 believers. I want you to notice that a writer does not command them to look only at these Old Testament saints, but to run the race looking unto Jesus. And I'm not talking about, and I'm certain our writer did not have this in mind, a literal picture of a bearded man or a figure of a man on the cross has been blessed by some illegitimate, illegitimate priest. It's an eye of faith because the verse tells us exactly what we're to look to. First of all, he is the author and perfecter of the faith, our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the beginning. He authored it. He began it for believers as well as being the end of it. He carries the Christian all the way through. The object of the believer's faith is the Lord Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith. We are not the originator of our faith. We dare not puff ourselves up saying, oh yeah, I believe, and these poor saps that don't believe is because I'm a lot more spiritual than they are. Enough of such foolishness. I am what I am only by God's grace. We are not the originator. We're not the finisher of our faith. Saving power doesn't originate within us. It's only of Jesus Christ, the finisher. He will bring the believer through many trials, and Christ will not lose one of them that he has purchased from the family of the devil. Remember, that's the family we came from. We came from the family of the devil. Christ saw us wallowing in our, own in our own blood, not able by our own strength to save ourselves, and he had mercy upon us. This demonstrates the great saving power of our God and Savior, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Now, there's many joys here. I think that, are, that is being brought out here. One of the joys that set before our Lord was his perfect life and his crucifixion, and that alone was going to make many righteous in the sight of an inflexible justice. The judge of all the earth will be satisfied with that price paid for the elect. And it was a joy for our Lord to accomplish salvation for those that the Father had given to him. It was also a joy for the Lord Jesus to do the will of God. This was the will of God, virgin birth, perfect life, his teaching, his miracles, the abuses that he took, his life, his suffering on the cross. All of this was for the sinner's good, and the Lord Jesus saw that as a joy doing the will of the Father. Keep that in mind, brethren, as we walk in this life and have difficulties, doing the will of God should be a joy to us. This is the gospel. The will of the Father being accomplished for sinners. Another thing that I think that would come into our Lord's mind as a joy is his exaltation. Doing the will of God. We'll see that later on at the latter part of the verse. But it, his exaltation, his, his resurrection and his glorification and exaltation was a joy to him as well. Christ endured the suffering of the cross he endured the wrath and anger of Almighty God for sinners, for sinners, all types of sinners, Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, kings, princes, citizens, and all races. There is no one that is outside of the boundary of God's salvation, all. And the Son is glorified in this. He's glorified in this. And it's a joy to him to do this. Many things. I think the verse, though, shows that the joy 
is more of in him enduring the cross. That's, that's what the verse deals with, is that the joy set before me endure the cross. Cannot help but think of the other joys as well that drove our Savior to that final task. Uh, do remember, Jesus did not remain in heaven's glory, but he descended in the form of a servant to a really nice world. He came to a God-hating, Christ-rejecting world as a servant, not as a king. Instead of the glory that the son had with the father, the son suffered the shame and disgrace as a common criminal and a chief of all sinners. And yet it was a joy, according to our passage for him, to bring about the salvation of sinners. And it was accomplished by his suffering and his death. Wicked ones being saved by that work alone, and that is to the glory of God, not to the glory of man, to the glory of God. And again, I've just barely touched on the joy that was set before our Savior. I'll leave the rest for you to meditate on during this week. But there's one other thing that I found interesting, and it, it, it really drove me to a lot of study, and that was despising the shame. Despising the shame. And um, I was greatly helped, I think it was by Matthew Henry in this. I think it was Matthew Henry. It might have been John Brown. I forget who it was. It was a commentator, one of the dead guys in my library that still speak to me. The Jewish leaders wanted to make a public spectacle and humiliate this sinless Lamb of God as our Savior hung naked on a cross. He endured the pain of the cross physically as well as spiritually. The greatest stroke is the stroke that justice gave to him. But remember, our, our Lord did it in one sense with an eye of contempt. An eye of contempt, not with a smile. And this is what I mean by that. Our Lord was despised as reproaches were hurled at him during his earthly ministry and especially at his trial, as he hung on the cross. People walked by the cross, and they mocked him. They mocked him. And I say this with all reverence. He was above those shaming him.